Welcome to this latest uh, strategic uh, conversation. I'm Jamie Shea, the Senior Fellow at Friends of Europe here in Brussels, and I'm delighted today to welcome as my guest uh, Mijana Spoljaric Egger, uh, who is a Swiss diplomat, but who is currently in a leading international position as Assistant Secretary General and Director of the Regional Bureau for Europe and the Commonwealth of Independent States at the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. Uh, so Mijana, a warm welcome and thank you very much for being uh, with us uh, today. Topic of conversation is where are we with the Western Balkans? Uh, in my time at NATO back in the 1990s, I had to deal with the bad side of the history of the Western Balkans when the Yugoslavia descended into uh, violence. Uh, but since that time, since the turn of the century, uh, the whole region has been moving on, moving forward, moving closer to Europe. Uh, many of the countries today, the latest being North Macedonia, have joined NATO. Uh, Serbia is negotiating, uh, like Montenegro, to join the European Union, which Croatia and Slovenia have joined already. And the good news just a couple of uh, months ago was that North Macedonia and Albania now have been given the green light uh, to start negotiations hopefully soon, also uh, to join the uh, European uh, uh, Union. So what I would like today is to ask my guest, where exactly are we uh, in terms of the Western Balkans really being truly uh, European, in terms of their economic development, in terms of their institutions, in terms of the freedom of the press, in terms of civil society? Uh, where exactly are we? What progress has been achieved? Uh, and what remains to be done? So again, Mijana, thank you very much. And now over to you. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you for having me in this conversation. And I'm very happy to um, work every now and then and uh, consistently with the Friends of Europe. It's a very important institution in Brussels. And I'm very much looking forward to our exchange today. If, if you ask me where, where the Western Balkans are, uh, then I would generally say, you know, in spite of the fact that many of the underlying political issues haven't been resolved and in spite of the frustration of this not having happened, the region is doing relatively well in, in terms of human development. We are talking about mostly now middle income to upper middle income countries. Some of them have already joined the European unions and others are on the way. There has been no open conflict and as you mentioned you know the most recent green light uh, given to north macedonia and albania is is definitely a very important milestone in in the process of european integration and it is true still today the european integration is the key driver for development in the western balkans but we also see now with the COVID pandemic the underlying issues and especially the socio-economic and political fragility that comes to the fore um, that has always existed in the region and that we have to still cope with and help the governments you know to overcome and if we talk about underlying issues we we have to say it's a high level of inform informality relatively weak institutions still, and, and with this a relatively low level of trust in public institutions uh, by the population, and, and a high rate of out-migration. And, and this is a very complex challenge that we are working on at the moment to first understand the sources. Of course, the most obvious ones are on the table, but then if you try to find solutions to it, you realize that you can do it by having one measure or the other, you have to look at the full specter of how a country and the government can provide perspectives to, to its population. Now, what we see also with the COVID crisis at the moment is that all the governments in the region struggle with, you know, on the one hand, securing a fiscal space um, and there the European Union's contribution together with the European Investment Bank is again, very, very important. But, but governments need to understand how they can calibrate, you know, the, you know, providing immediate support to the population and to the most vulnerable, but then also looking at the more long-term challenges that the region faces. And here is where we get to the, you know, issues and things that should have been addressed 10 years ago, or maybe even earlier, that still should constitute 
a high priority for the governments in the region. And if you look at the Western Balkans in particular, but what I'm going to say is very much the case in the whole Europe and uh, Central Asia region that I cover, then it is the socioeconomic impact that will be characterized by high job losses. Yeah. And these job losses will hit predominantly youth and predominantly the less skilled. Yeah. And that brings us back to the problem of informality and to the problem of social protection systems that don't reach all yeah. parts of society equally. But then a key challenge that, that has been come, coming to the fore and I think is not adequately addressed uh, by probably all of the governments in the region is the issue of economic empowerment of women. Yeah. Women in the region are still predominantly working in the informal sector. There is a pay gap, but there's also a gender tech gap. We have to ensure, if you look at economic, impact, economic development in the region, that 50% of the society are included in the jobs that will need to be created in order to sustain economic development and, and reduce the inequalities mm -hmm. in the region. What is important here also to make the linkage between domestic violence and, and women controlling assets. Yeah. For me, this goes hand in hand. Yeah. The, the region will develop if it, it becomes proactive on promoting women yeah. in the society and economy. I, I hear your point, and, and I would like to come back to some of the interesting structural issues that you raised, including, of course, the empowerment of women. But first of all, we should perhaps deal with the COVID-19 emergency, which is the immediate crisis. How is the region being hit by COVID? Is it as bad as it's been in certain parts of Europe? Uh, do the Western Balkan countries have the health uh, facilities, you know, the protective clothing, the respirators, the testing kits, all of the things that we've been debating up here in Brussels to cope with the situation? And if they're more vulnerable, uh, are they getting the aid now uh, internationally uh, to be able to sort of deal with uh, spikes in infection? It'd be good maybe just to get a sense of uh, how resilient they are vis-a-vis uh, -vis COVID. I think the health systems are, um, you know, fragile, but not beyond what we see generally happening across the Europe and Central Asia region. So they're coping relatively well, but what we saw in all the countries is, is the urgent need for support in protective gear and in medical uh, installations. And here upholding the supply chains was the biggest challenge. It was not so much money and funds. I think the governments knew what they needed, but what they needed was assistance in, in getting to the sources and, and you know, transporting the necessary goods uh, to the country. So our immediate concern when the COVID uh, outbreak came was to secure these supply chains for the countries. And I think we, we've done relatively well, also again, in cooperation with the European Commission. Um, we also worked with the governments uh, in securing business continuity. I think that went well as well. Um, strengthening crisis management systems and coordination at the national level. But the true challenge will come with the socioeconomic recovery. I yeah. think here it is where we need to put our focus and emphasis on. Thank you. And so coming back to the, the structural issues, when, when I dealt with the, the region again some time ago, we were coming out of the conflict. And so the international aid was very much geared to uh, ending the conflict, you know, de demobilizing forces, rounding up uh, 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 heavy weapons, uh, separating those forces, uh, uh, trying to uh, arrest uh, war criminals and all of this. Has the international help now, in your view, moved successfully from the, the you know, legacy of war uh, side, the security side of the equation, more towards dealing with the social and economic issues you described. Do you think the international assistance is still a bit stuck, if you like, in the groove of the security side? That would be my first question. If I may, just a follow up. Um, when it comes to all of the issues you described, to what extent is the region now helping itself? Is it still looking to the international community to provide all of the advice and help? Or do you see people, civil society, government, sort of taking their destiny in their own hands and really trying to move the region on themselves. Uh, so uh, be very interested in those two aspects. I, um, I, I do link security to economic development to fundamental rights and, and institution building. And I think this is 
this is the beauty of the Agenda 2030 and its Sustainable Development Goals, and which is very much convergent with the accession criteria for the European Union. And, and there you see it, you know, as an integrated piece. You cannot de-link climate change from security, from economic development. And again, you know, inclusion of, of all layers of society. Um, I'm speaking about women, but I, I'm also speaking about Roma. All the vulnerable groups and ethnic minorities in the Western Balkans have to be included in sustainable development plans. Now, I think the international community has realized that at the latest 2015, but, but way beyond, um, that the focus has to be integral and that we always have to have the full specter in front of us mm -hmm. of things we need to achieve. Now, the governments themselves are looking to UNDP precisely for the reason of wanting to get out of the middle income trap on their own, but with international support. And I'm very much in the country and in the municipal areas when I travel the Western Balkans and when I visit our programs, because this is where UNDP works predominantly. We cover up to 80% of all municipalities in the region, and this is where the core of our work is. And when I speak to farmers, when I speak to people in the, in the different towns and villages, this is what I hear. They say, we want to get on our feet. We don't want to be dependent on the international assistance. We want to join the European Union. This is a very important perspective. But we need options. We need future for our children. We need to know that they will be well off. And even if they have a job today, if they are not sure that the children will be having a good situation, they will leave the country. Mm -hmm. So this, this future, they want it very much. They are willing to participate, but they are also looking for assistance, including financial assistance, assistance that will help them get out of that trap and vicious circle. Yeah. When I used to speak to Carl Bildt uh, years ago, when he was the UN High Representative in Bosnia, he felt that you know the way to uh, help the region to cooperate across the border was not always through governments, but through business, you know, private sector, entrepreneurs, small and medium sized enterprises, you know, that uh, business, the chance to make money would sort of be, would dissolve political disagreements. Yeah, are there signs that, you know, business activity in terms of individual initiatives are, 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 are taking off and uh, any good examples that you, you could point to? You mentioned farmers, for, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there, or are they still sort of largely waiting you know for government subsidies or for you know government-led employment schemes no I, I don't think uh, young people of today are waiting for government subsidies on the country they they, mm. they want to work but what they need is is basic skills um, that are required by the market and I do agree that business is you know border blind probably also you know ethnicity blind uh, and is a great way of uh, you know promoting development in the region and we do work with the private sector increasingly it doesn't go without them we also need to help SMEs nowadays to survive and we have to protect SMEs because they are a key employer in the region at the same time if you don't remove the barriers of, of connectivity in the region and this has to be done by political agreements then business will hit dead ends so we have to work on both ends. You know, we have to promote regional cooperation and co connectivity through government cooperation and at the same time look at how business can best possibly facilitate this process. Where I see a great opportunity that 10 years ago probably wasn't as visible as it is today, and especially since COVID, is digital transformation. Ah, yeah. I think the digital component is a huge opportunity for the region because it's still holds relatively high levels of human capital. It is a very digital society and there already are signs of regional cooperation in that area, like the agreement, the conclusion of a broadband agreement that show that in this area, unless they connect, they will not be able to thrive. 
Uh, it, you mentioned also, of course, the, the importance of uh, uh, the role of women and uh, being able to uh, have their opportunities. Uh, is the, do you think the education system uh, geared uh, sufficiently to provide the type of education to equip young people, women especially, for this? Uh, I was struck, you know, visiting Kosovo many times that they had lots of private universities, quite expensive, but the, the state institutions did not seem to be so good. Hopefully it's improved since. But uh, you do have, don't you, sort of very young populations uh, as a percentage of the overall population. And I imagine in terms of all of those people coming onto the workforce every year and looking for jobs, it, it, it must make it highly pressurized. I, I think the education system is, is and, that, and how much investment go into the education system is key. Um, as, as far as primary education and basic as education is concerned, I think the, how the countries coped with the COVID crisis, and we have also in some instances worked with them to sec secure online schooling platforms or establish online schooling platforms. I think that, that went relatively well. What we need to do is, is as I said, the future look at the future basic skills and look at you know, the education system and whether it is compatible with the future of work. And again, whether we promote the right people into the right areas of, of research and education. And, and it is in STEM, basically. There's a high potential in the region if investments are going into that direction. Also to, again, as I also said, close the gender pay gap by promoting women into these areas of work, because the digital um, is, is now affecting all parts of society. And one area where the, the, the countries are moving towards is green economy, circular economy, more sustainable ways of production. They will hopefully create a lot of jobs going forward, but they will also need to involve a lot of new technologies and, and knowledge on how to use these tools. Thank you. Yep, we unfortunately don't have much time left. Uh, such an interesting topic and so little time. But I'd like, uh, before we close, just to ask you two, two things. I mean, firstly, uh, the European Union is now investing heavily in the Western Balkans. This is linked, of course, to the accession uh, processes and the aid. Uh, Charlie Michel, the president of the European Council, who was uh, seeing uh, the Serb president, Vukic, in Brussels last week, was suggesting quite a large uh, uh, commission uh, aid package will be rolled out in the autumn to help the Western Balkans. So could you say how the UNDP cooperates with the EU, particularly in, in terms of the aid and where you work together and uh, how you sort of try to create a synergy from these joint efforts? And then finally, Mijama, uh, hopefully we'll have time to squeeze this in, but it'd be good to know about your own sort of uh, immediate priorities and activities uh, in the U UNDP. When you wake up in the morning, you think Western Balkans, what is immediately on your agenda this week? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think I, my agenda is exactly the same, whether I wake up here in New York and work for UNDP or whether I wake up in, in Brussels and work for the European Commission. And this is how it should be. I mean, we have to have the same analysis of the challenges of the things we need to do. It doesn't make sense to walk alone or separately. And this is also why we have greatly reinforced our dialogue with uh, our colleagues in Brussels, making sure that we always align. And UNDP wouldn't be working at such a high level in the Western Balkans if it weren't for the cooperation with uh, DG Near in particular. I think uh, we share the same analysis and, and this is where we cooperate together, have cooperated together before the crisis and will hopefully do more in the future. One is strengthening social protection, as I said. Uh, the second area where we need to move forward is, is greening the economy. That's extremely important. We have to transform um, public institutions into more transfer transparent institutions. We have to improve the delivery of public services. And there again, you have a, a huge digital, digital component as well. I mean, it, if you increase and improve the quality of services, if you enhance transparency, this makes um, people's receptivity to change even better. We have to look at the vulnerable groups. We work together on Roma. Um, we have to make sure that nobody is left behind in the recovery process. 
and 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 hence also our joint focus on on gender empowerment uh, but also other vulnerable groups in the region and um we have to push for reforms i think it won't go without it and and with these reforms also always keep in mind that we have to promote social cohesion if youth is going to be hit then this is where we need to to re-emphasize our work and we also have to um work continue working on 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 initiatives like the dialogue for the future promoting cooperation and exchanges of views across borders I'm, I'm going to finish very briefly with just a sort of indiscreet question i hope you forgive me but again when i dealt with the balkans back in the 90s it was a long time ago i i despaired a little bit of the quality of the political leaders i met many of them and they struck me as being really prisoner of the past the old ancestral ethnic disputes i'm not asking you to commit indiscretions or name any names but do you think the region now has a more sort of european oriented more future oriented generation of political leaders that can help move the region forward rather than endlessly replay the old historical myths and disputes? I think it's good to know history and be aware of history. Um, but what is extremely important is now that we move forward and that we create an enabling environment for, for young people to stay in the country or even return to the country. And they will return to the country if they find the future that they want to have for themselves and for their children. So I wouldn't speak about, you know, are they more European than others? I think we know the values, we know the principles, and this is what, what everybody needs to achieve as a, as a policymaker, as, as a, you know, country leader, if he wants to keep his or her population in the country and have a sustainable future. John, thank you very much uh, for us answering all those questions today. Thank you for giving us a very comprehensive, uh, very expert uh, uh, oversight into the Western Balkans. It's clear that a lot of the very positive things are happening, thanks to you uh, and the UNDP and all of the colleagues you work with. And all I can say on behalf of Friends of Europe is please stay in your job for a long, long time. Uh, and don't go back to Switzerland yet and keep up the good work. So today my guest was Michana Spodjarek Egger, uh, the Assistant Secretary General and Director of the Regional Bureau for Europe and the Commonwealth of Independent States of the United Nations Development Programme. Please come back soon and tell us more on strategic conversation. But again, thanks for your time today. We appreciated it. Thank you, Jamie. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks.